Skeptics are quite justified when they point out the relative absurdity of the claims made by Hickson and Parker. The idea that two men on the Gulf Coast would be target for curious extraterrestrial travelers is barely suitable for bad science fiction. But however skeptical one chooses to be, one cannot deny the fact that something strange happened on the bank of the Pascagoula River in October of 1973. Could the men be the victims of a practical joke? This seems highly unlikely. Any apparatus needed to fake a descending craft and its occupants would be far too cumbersome and be far too logistically intensive to operate, let alone keep completely out of sight before and after the main event. Could the men have unwittingly seen and partaken in a government experiment? The UFO in question exhibited such miraculous abilities as effortless levitation, near-silent propulsion, and hyper-acceleration, or perhaps even teleportation. These abilities would undoubtedly whet the appetite of any military strategist, particularly one during the Cold War, and would make for a weapons system with the ability to easily render moot any power on Earth, even in the 21st century. Since neither the United States nor the USSR were subsequently invaded by glowing blue footballs piloted by their respective rivals' air force, it is reasonable to assume that neither superpower nor anyone else on Earth was responsible. Of course, it is possible that someone was performing a sociological experiment, perhaps to test the media and cultural response to a UFO kidnapping. But if so, we are once again left with the problem of unreasonably complicated logistics. Considering the contents of the secret audio recordings produced by Sheriff Fred Diamond, a hoax seems improbable. Either Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker were deeply frightened by something, or they were the greatest unsung thespians in history. Putting the obvious problem of the recordings aside, other than the general unrealness of it all, most arguments in favor of a hoax fall into one of three categories. Those that impugn the men's character, primarily that of Hickson, those that emphasize the rather sloppy manner in which the polygraph was administered, and those that point to inconsistencies in the story and its setting. Before working for the F.B. Walker & Sons shipyard, Hickson was employed by the Ingalls Shipbuilding Company as a skilled shipfitter. He was fired from this position on November 20th, 1972 for, quote, conduct unbecoming a supervisor, unquote. Specifically, Hickson was accused of being involved in dubious financial dealings, as stated by Joe Esterhaus in the January 17th, 1974 issue of Rolling Stone magazine, quote, Hickson was borrowing money from the boys working under him, then paying them back by trying to finagle them promotions." Unquote. Despite this obviously questionable behavior, there was never any indication Hickson attempted anything predatory or blatantly criminal. It is possible he was simply bad with money and found himself desperate to escape a cycle of debt, a not uncommon occurrence for a middle-aged family man. The implication, of course, is if Charles Hickson was willing to commit such woefully unethical or desperate deeds, such as participating in payola and declaring bankruptcy, which he did three months before his UFO encounter, he was likely motivated to concoct some outrageous tale for financial gain, a view that amounts to little more than an ad hominem. There was nothing particularly ingratiating about the story. From the outset, Hickson and Parker were fully aware of how ridiculous it sounded to everyone and openly indicated so. Though both men eventually achieved a sort of mythical status within the UFO community, one would be hard-pressed to view this as the fulfillment of personal ambition, particularly for two men who had shown very little prior interest in the subject of UFOs before the autumn of 1973. Money was sought after, mainly by parties not directly connected to the whole affair, including the Reverend Billy Riddick recorded a sermon titled Visitors from Outer Space, What Seeth the Lord, and offered copies for $2 apiece. In Revelation chapter 9, we read about the creatures out of hell that have faces like men and hair like women. In Revelation chapter 16, we read about spirits like frogs. Go to the toy stores and you'll find an abundant supply of creepy creatures, spiders, and monsters. Turn on the television and you see much violence and ugliness. Look at the movie ads and see monster movies that are showing in every town. Go to almost any public gathering and you will see the faces of men and hair like women. The Mississippi Press Register was quick to print a booklet, UFOs Over Mississippi, a seven-day space odyssey, which within two weeks had sold a thousand copies. Attorney Joe Kalingo, who acted more or less as an unofficial public relations manager for the men, openly commented to reporter Esterhaus, quote, How much do you think we could make on their exclusive story? A million, you think? I figure if we sell magazine and book and movie rights to one of the big studios, that can be a lot of money. 
unquote. Charles Hickson did ultimately take and pass a polygraph examination at the end of October 1973. No one disputes this. Some skeptics, particularly Philip Klass, have argued that the affirming conclusions indicated by the test were made invalid by the lack of experience and abilities of the examiner from the Pendleton Detective Agency, Scott Glasgow. But as valid as this criticism may be, it does little more than cloud the air surrounding Hickson's story and polygraphy in general. Believers and skeptics both tend to place a great deal of significance on the results of polygraph examinations. While this is quite understandable for the former, it is in fact a somewhat untenable position for those of a traditionally critical mindset, as polygraphy is widely viewed in medical circles as little better than pseudoscientific voodoo. Although colloquially known as a lie detector, a polygraph does not in fact detect lies. It does, however, measure the relative electrical conductivity of skin as well as metabolic characteristics such as heartbeat, respiration, and blood pressure. The basic idea is to carefully monitor these characteristics to determine the truthfulness of a person via observed fluctuations brought on by stress. Polygraph examinations administered for reasons other than specific crimes are typically structured as a control question test. In such a test, a set of neutral control questions are first asked to establish a metabolic baseline and to confirm that a candidate is physiologically responding in a predictable manner. These initial questions are not related to the particular subject of interest. Next, a set of relevant questions are asked and the associated responses are recorded. Theoretically, if a comparatively greater amount of stress is recorded during the control phase, the subject is considered honest. Likewise, if the response is greater during the relevant phase, the conclusion will be a probable deception. More extreme responses are typically viewed as a multiplicative indicator. Unfortunately, there is virtually no reliable way for a polygraph to differentiate between stress brought on by deliberate deception and that generated by situational anxiety. False positives, even in high-profile cases, are not unheard of. In 1986, for example, Wichita, Kansas resident Bill Wiggerly was falsely accused of the murder of his wife, Vicki, based partly on his failure of two polygraphs. Although not formally charged, Mr. Wiggerly lived under a cloud of suspicion until exculpatory evidence surfaced in 2004, directing authorities to the actual guilty party, the infamous BTK killer, Dennis Lynn Rader. But even if one disregards questionable physiological reactions and assumes 100% accuracy in the recorded data, it is absolutely impossible for a polygraph to differentiate between reality and its subjective mutations. While it is true that Scott Glasgow, the man responsible for administering the test to Charles Hickson, found Hickson's polygraph to show no signs of deception, that assessment depends entirely on what constitutes deception. Hallucinations and delusions seem very real to those experiencing them, but they do not objectively exist in the real world. Is a person who openly makes claims of talking mushrooms being deceitful if they really believe they've just had a conversation with a toadstool? Here, there must be a distinction made between a person's internal reality and a separate platonic idea of the objective reality outside of the proverbial cave. Even if we consider the most modern techniques of truth testing, such as real-time brain imaging, this becomes an insurmountable problem. In a United Press International article, UFO Stands Up in Lie Test, polygrapher Glasgow remarked, quote, It is my opinion that Hickson told the truth when he stated that he believes he saw a spaceship, that he was taken into the spaceship, and that he saw three creatures, unquote. Hickson apparently believed his experiences were real, and this belief was reflected in his bodily processes. But the fact that he wasn't lying to the polygrapher doesn't prove that an extraterrestrial spacecraft and its occupants actually interrupted his night of fishing. A past polygraph may, of course, corroborate other evidence and lend support to other testimony, such as a claim made by an unconnected remote witness. But since this case has no such witness aside from Parker, whose story is also dubious, Hickson's polygraph results are little better than an unsubstantiated opinion. Furthermore, according to Glenn Maggard, a licensed polygrapher and member of the American Polygraph Association, rather than metabolic measurements, the effectiveness of polygraphs depend primarily on the observations of and techniques employed by the examiner. Despite the electronic accoutrements, a polygraph examination is much more of a psychological test than a physical one. Unless he or she is a blatant sociopath and adept at lying or unconcerned with resulting consequences, an individual is typically very bad at hiding deception from a figure of authority, in this case the examiner. Imagine the response a mother would likely coax from her child simply by asking, is there something you want to tell me?
The fact that Calvin Parker had been suddenly hospitalized for a nervous condition the very morning of his scheduled polygraph and thus unable to take the test is also not necessarily suspicious. Whether he actually experienced a UFO abduction or simply believed he did, one doesn't need a great deal of imagination to understand the psychological trauma that would result. Those who contend that the comparatively poor qualifications of polygrapher Scott Glasgow, who at the time had not actually completed his internship, cast doubt upon the accuracy of Charles Hickson's passing score, should also consider their own response had Glasgow's opinion indicated gross deception. Would his credentials still be in doubt? Would the polygraph results suddenly be beyond reproach? Still, it is interesting that Mr. Glasgow was employed by a longtime friend of attorney Joe Kalingo, the man who had arranged Hickson's examination. It is also interesting that sometime later, Kalingo had, unbeknownst to most of the media, declined the chance to have a polygraph administered by Captain Charles Wimberly of the Mobile Police Department, a man with over 13 years of board-certified experience. In his book, UFOs Explained, skeptic Philip Klass notes that the earliest newspaper accounts state that Hickson and Parker's October 11th experience occurred around 7 p.m. It is somewhat curious that only a few weeks later, while speaking as a guest on the Dick Cavett show, Hickson suggests the incident occurred between 8 and 9. Concurrently, while as a guest on the similarly popular Mike Douglas show, Hickson states everything happened around 9 o'clock. On several occasions, Hickson himself admitted he did not know how long he'd been inside the UFO either before, during, or after the alleged scanning procedure. Considering the distortion of time that generally accompanies a traumatic event, a realistic estimation would be that the event lasted from anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes. If Hickson's recollection of the rest of the evening are relatively accurate, that he and Parker spent about 45 minutes deliberating and then went into town to contact someone, eventually arriving at the sheriff's office at about a quarter past 11, the latter 9 p.m. estimation is not unreasonable. But the fact that within two months, Hickson changed his story in such a dramatic fashion, two hours is, after all, quite a chronological leap, could be interpreted as an attempt to widen the event window and possibly account for discrepancies elsewhere. Also on the Mike Douglas show, Hickson for the first time mentions that the interior of the UFO was as bright as a welding flash, and further explains that he had experienced severe eye pain for about three days. The day after the incident, Hickson and Parker were examined at Keesler Air Force Base for radiation exposure, yet neither men ever mentioned any form of eye injury, nor was one noted. This inconsistency is made all the more puzzling when one ponders the relatively high amount of detail Hickson recalled. How could Charles Hickson have observed so much when his vision was impaired? Certainly he could have obtained a few fleeting glimpses, enough to discern his whereabouts and the general goings-on, but one should consider the fact that Hickson and Parker were accosted by three non-human entities that had appeared suddenly from a strange object hovering several yards away at night, entities that moved swiftly, backlit as they approached by brilliant light from the craft's interior. In view of these relevant details, Hickson seems to have accomplished a rather remarkable feat. Defenders of Hickson and Parker often disregard the lack of independent witnesses to the UFO event out of hand, suggesting the men were in a remote area and that verification would have been difficult to come by. In fact, the abduction site was neither remote nor hidden in any way. Shalpeter Dock, where Hickson and Parker encountered the UFO, is only about a half a mile from the center of town. The site is found within a few hundred yards of, and more or less directly between what were, at least in 1973, two drawbridges that spanned the Pascagoula River, U.S. Highway 90 to the north, and the Louisville and Nashville Railroad Bridge to the south. According to information gathered by Murphy Givens, reporter for the Mississippi Press Register, both bridges were manned by an on-site tender 24 hours a day. Neither tenders saw anything on the night in question, both of them having an unobstructed view of the area surrounding the dock. Furthermore, cameras equipped with good quality Zoomar lenses at the Ingalls West Bank facility, a shipyard contracted to build vessels for the U.S. Navy, saw nothing of note. The Ingalls cameras kept constant watch over the environs surrounding the alleged UFO encounter site, which itself was about a mile distant, and consequently on the edge of a security perimeter. Keeping vigil over a drawbridge can be a rather tedious job, and it is possible that whomever was sitting in their respective booths simply wasn't paying attention. And while cameras are by their nature inherently unbiased, they are not autonomous. An operator is either interpreting real-time imagery or reviewing recorded images, both of which are subject to powers of observation and interpretation. Something as out of the ordinary as a glowing blue UFO landing a mile away for at least 20 minutes would probably be seen, 
but there is a slim possibility that it might not, given a hapless but not particularly outlandish set of circumstances. It is assumed that cameras were looking in the right spot. It is assumed the cameras were all functioning properly and all being attended to. They may not have been one or any of these things. Another explanation championed by some investigators is that of a shared psychotic disorder, also known as a shared delusion or folie à deux, a French term meaning madness of two. Strictly speaking, a delusion is a belief that remains immutable regardless of any contradictory evidence. For example, a man may believe his dog can talk, despite the fact that his dog lacks the physical organs necessary to do so. Delusions may be connected to emotional states, such as the steadfast certainty in the numbers on one's lottery ticket five minutes before the quadrillion to one ball drop. They may also seem comparatively down to earth, but still extremely unlikely, such as the belief that one is the target of a team of covert government assassins. Then again, it's not paranoia if someone is out to get you. A diagnosed condition in psychiatry since the 19th century, one of the more famous cases of folie à deux, actually a folie à famille, a delusion affecting a large familial group, involved five members of the Tromp family from the town of Sylvan in Victoria, Australia. By all accounts, the Tromps were a loving and well-adjusted family until Father Mark Tromp suffered a sudden mental breakdown, causing him to experience paranoid delusions. Because of the family's strong psychological connection, they were quite sympathetic to Mr. Trump's condition, eventually believing his fantasies of impending attack from nefarious evildoers. Convinced they were in great danger, the entire family fled their home, eventually separating and wandering to all corners of New South Wales, by foot, train, and even stolen car. They were all found several days later, unharmed but terribly confused, save Mr. Trump, who continued to suffer from paranoia until properly medicated. Could Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker have experienced something similar? Although no one knows the cause for shared psychotic disorder, it is believed that stress and social isolation are primary factors, as well as asymmetric personal relationships, where one party is psychologically dominant over the other. There is no disputing that Hickson and Parker had been under an inordinate amount of stress at the time of the October 11th sighting. Hickson had been undergoing a great deal of financial hardship. He had been fired from his job less than a year earlier. His much beloved son was stationed overseas during wartime. Parker, on the other hand, had recently moved 100 miles from his home to start his adult life. He recently entered a physically demanding field of work and was due to be married by the end of the year. Hickson and his wife were providing room and board for Parker and he undoubtedly viewed them as proxies for his own parents and trusted them as such. If Parker trusted Hickson enough, he could have been swept up in a fantastic narrative. When interviewed by authorities, Hickson did confess to drinking alcohol, though Parker was found to be completely sober. And while Hickson only claimed to consume alcohol after his experience in an attempt to calm himself, he may have been reluctant to state otherwise, realizing the information might damage his credibility. If Hickson had entered a dream state while at the Shalpeter dock, whether from intoxication or general fatigue, it is entirely possible he misinterpreted something commonplace, something like a passing aircraft or the rising moon, and found himself trapped in a semi-lucid fantasy. Perhaps Parker was himself asleep, and therefore in a highly suggestible frame of mind, and was unexpectedly woken up by his obviously agitated fishing partner. Still in a mental fog, Parker may have listened to him recount a hair-raising dream in a wholly convincing and sincere manner, and may have subsequently become convinced of its objective reality. This explanation would account for the dearth of remote witnesses, as well as the men's later emotional state, though to be fair, a folie à deux would also require an extremely specific set of circumstances and conditions. Finally, like the purloined letter of Edgar Allan Poe, the answer may very well be hiding in plain sight. An intellectually honest investigation must acknowledge the possibility that, however unlikely, Hickson and Parker's experience was exactly as described and they encountered a craft from somewhere other than the Earth. The location seems to make a certain amount of sense. Pascagoula is a relatively quiet corner of a developed area. A modest-sized craft could approach, land, and depart without drawing a great deal of attention. Probably not a particular concern for creatures with the technological equivalent of magic, but the most sensible course of action if studying human behavior, if that was indeed what was going on. One does not watch wild gorillas from an open clearing, for instance. The UFO entity's modus operandi seems to fit that of a more terrestrial field researcher out to gather data on some of the local life, decisive, efficient, non-destructive. That the men may have been traumatized afterward doesn't necessarily point to ill intentions. Herd animals that are tranquilized and tagged for scientific purposes would probably feel the same way and zoologists are not inherently evil. <laughs>
Regarding the entities themselves, a common argument in support of the men's story points to the unusual appearance of the UFO occupants, essentially theorizing no one would make up something so weird and unique. Over the latter half of the 20th century, the popular idea of just what an extraterrestrial looks like has slowly changed from human in a mylar suit to the ubiquitous big-eyed grey found in countless movies and books. Ironically, though not totally unheard of, the cliched little green men are very rarely reported. This is not to say that bona fide extraterrestrials actually look this way, but what is reported during close encounters of the third or fourth kind has taken on a definite character, which in turn has become part of the cultural zeitgeist. Considering this typical imagery, the entities described by Hickson and Parker are indeed very strange. About five foot in height, with pincered hands, fused legs, very wrinkly, elephant-like skin, eyeless faces, and conical appendages in place of nose and ears, their appearance exudes a cold, phantasmagoric menace. Except for color, very few UFO occupants have ever been reported to share these features. This creates a curious paradox. The unique look of the Pascagoula entities makes them less likely to be a hoax, as Hickson and Parker are obviously not using the standard extraterrestrial morphology as inspiration. But the entities are so unusual, one has to wonder if they are an invention, intentionally created to be exactly opposite of typical expectations to throw off suspicion. Oddly, one aspect of the entity's behavior that casts suspicion on the entire story is not typically reported, but is quite relevant. According to Charles Hickson in the book UFO Contact at Pascagoula, co-written by Hickson and William Mendez, after being released and watching the UFO vanish in a flash, quote, something raced across my mind. We are peaceful. We meant you no harm, unquote. Presumably, the transmitter of such a reassuring message would know the intended recipient was both self-aware and intelligent, and would probably react badly to being forcefully examined. A reassurance does little good after the fact, though. The message coming when it did makes very little sense in any context. If the entities were peaceful, as the message suggests, why not simply land and introduce themselves in a less threatening manner? Hickson and Parker would still be in shock, but would likely have some of their fears dulled. If they were not peaceful, why not offer reassurances beforehand to placate a potentially hostile subject, or why offer them at all? In fact, Hickson never mentioned the telepathic message to Sheriff Diamond or any investigator until 1974. When asked by author William Mendez why he didn't mention the message to authorities, Hickson stated that at the time he wasn't sure if the message was from the UFO entities or simply his own imagination.